I hope uh, the film is not being too taxing. Uh, so you are bright and quick. Uh, so this morning's speaker, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Stefan Mordas from uh, University of Luxembourg. Uh, he's the head of uh, computational mechanics there, plus other things. Uh, he has a very eclectic background. I found that uh, after his schooling in France, he did his graduate studies in Northwestern University in the United States uh, in, on a subject which, which is uh, something I share with Stefan. I did not know that before. <laughs> in geotechnical engineering, which is rather uh, great. Beyond his uh, graduate studies, he has uh, worked on a variety of fields uh, centered around applied mathematics and, and mechanics. And uh, uh, the other thing I want to note is that he is also a uh, Beltrami Award honoree uh, from Lennox. So I'm sure we are all uh, eager to hear what he has to tell us. So without uh, taking too much more time, because if I have to read this, uh, CV and tell you all the things that he has done, we will probably take all this time. So I turn it over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for having me here. It's been a very nice conference with amazing talks. I learned really a lot and super rare these days to be at a, at a conference where all the talks that you listen to are, are really fascinating and interesting. I never got bored and it's super, super nice to be here. So I uh, really had to fight with myself to select a title, as uh, Elena will testify, because I was finalizing the title yesterday and I couldn't decide how to do it, because the, the whole conference is about complex uh, mechanical systems or complex systems in mechanics and, and so on, and mathematics. I tried to uh, focus the talk a bit about the way people are thinking, but I also tried not to talk too much about mechanics because I'm probably the one here that knows the least about mechanics, so at le I would like to, t to maybe uh, convey some other messages that you may not know uh, by talking a, a little bit outside of what we typically talk about. Um, so usually you will see these QR codes a bit everywhere, so there are the links to papers or references that I talk about on the slide, so to avoid having to type frantically. Uh, also, I will record the presentation, I'll put it on our YouTube channel anyway, so if you want to listen to it again, if you missed some references, you can always go back there. The, okay. All right, so that, that is a snapshot of my team at some point in time. It's never possible to have the whole team because it's varying constantly, people coming in and out. This is the University of Luxembourg, founded exactly 20 years ago. Uh, exactly also the year I got my PhD, which is quite funny. I was reflecting on this walking to the conference this morning. It's exactly 20 years I got my PhD, 20 years the university was founded. It's a very young university. I highly recommend that you think of uh, joining there for a short visit or maybe as a, a guest for our Institute of Advanced Studies, which was created uh, last year which allows visits, which are uh, normally very exciting for multidisciplinary topics. I will show also some results coming from the founding of this Institute of Advanced Studies, which I think uh, could, could give you some ideas what is done there. And uh, it's super multidis multidisciplinary and multicultural country. People speak four languages uh, nat natively. Uh, Luxembourgish, German, English, French. French being the central language in the country. Uh, for all administrative purposes and so on. Um, so you'll feel at ease there wherever you're from. That's basically the point. A huge uh, immigration community from Italy, from Portugal, from everywhere. And, um, and so I think it's a very welcoming country where I'm very happy for the last 10 years and I don't plan to, uh, to move out. It's really, really nice. And the university is super dynamic, heavily funded, very easy to get funding. So uh, that is also why we are doing so many things. So here, uh, uh, here is the first um, quote I'd like to think about with you. So um, essentially today there will, be, uh, there will be one message which is that errors can help us uh, understand and co complex systems and help us basically optimize them maybe. Um, so that, that is from uh, Laplace, so he, he's basically saying that if we regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future, an intellect which at a certain moment would know all the forces that set nature in motion and all the positions of all items 
which nature is composed of. It's this intellect was also able and vast enough to submit this data to analysis, so basically what we're trying to do uh, continuously. It would embrace a single formula, the movement of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atoms. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. So um, that is an, another quote, which I think, uh, and then I translated the best I could. I couldn't find the official translation, so I didn't but um, we are so far from knowing all the agents of nature. So now it's saying that if we knew everything, that everything would be fine, but of course we don't, so uh, nothing is really so easy. Um, and there are various modes of action. It would not be philosophical to deny phenomena solely because they are inexplicable to the current state of our knowledge. Instead, we must examine them with even greater scrutiny, the more difficult they appear to admit to be, basically. This is where the calculation of probabilities becomes essential to determine to what extent we should multiply observations or experiments in order to obtain in favor of the agents that indicate a probability greater than the reasons we may otherwise have for not admitting. Okay, basically, that means that if we want to believe something, it, we, we have a, a former belief, in order to disqualify this belief or qualify this belief, a bit like uh, Popper's idea, uh, you have a choice. Either, either you make more experiments or you just believe whatever you, you have now, right? And you think that this, this is true. And it's funny because Ronald Rumsfeld uh, was saying something a bit similar, which are there are known knowns, there are things you know that you know, there are uh, known unknowns, there are things you know you don't know, and there are unknown unknowns, there are things you don't know you don't know. And what we're talking about today is the things we don't know we don't know, and trying to see how that can help us design and understand uh, mechanical systems. So, for example, if you imagine, you know, today it's becoming reality that people are sending spacecraft in order to go where no, nobody else has gone, gone before, to use a, a quote that everybody knows, uh, then uh, you would imagine that this thing is going to fly somewhere, but you don't know exactly what's going to happen, because you cannot know simply because you've never been there, and there is no way or very little way that you can design this uh, spacecraft knowing everything that's going to happen. So, in a way, you are in a, in a case where you have unknown unknowns. If you look at the one Earth system, which is a way to encompass everything, one health, the health of the, the population, the ecology, the ecosystems, the way that we generate energy and resources and so on, this is a, obviously a complex system. It's so complex that we think that we remedy problems by creating iron, uh, lithium-ion batteries, but then we create another problem because we, we set off another disequilibrium in the system. So, the question is, can we look at ecology, for example, because if you think of an ecosystem, it's designed in a way to be self-sustaining. So what is wrong in this, this ecosystem is the human uh, race, which is actually wreaking havoc in the whole normal, normally functioning ecosystem. So if we could look at real ecosystems and understand what makes them actually sustainable and use that to, um, to actually design better uh, systems, that would be... Uh, so that's the concept of One Earth. Um, so that's why it's important. So we're talking about complex systems. This is a slide that everybody knows. It's from Wikipedia. And it tells you about all the disciplines that are involved. No need to try to read everything. It's illegible. But uh, it's essentially that you have a system which has input and output and is trying to optimize itself. So now, how is that related to what we're doing? So my background is mathematical modeling. It's uh, engineering originally, but I think at heart I'm really a mathematician, although because of the French system I never realized my dream of doing actual math, but <laughs> this is the, um, or maybe because I was not uh, decisive enough, but basically mathematical modeling is the process of starting from a continuous problem, which is what you see in real life, and getting to a numerical solution. And in between you have several steps, the first being to create a mathematical model, the second to discretize this mathematical model, either using discrete systems like discrete elements or maybe using partial differential equations that are coupled together. And at each step of the process, you're um, committing some errors. The first is the model error. Am I choosing the right model for what I observe? And the second is the discretization error. Once I have this model, am I able to solve the problem resulting from this model correctly? So in other words, just asking two questions. Am I solving the right problem? And am I solving the problem right? And these two problems are usually mixed up uh, in, the, in a lot of the literature. So people talk about validation when they actually mean verification, because validation would be compare what I solve 
to reality. This is, I'm trying to validate the model. So that includes solving the problem correctly, but the main question is, am, am I actually setting the problem, writing it down properly in the first place? So this, these are the two things we're talking about, and today I'll be mostly talking about validation, because we're going to talk about trying to select the right model and update that model in, uh, in real time. So this is the, I think there is a paradigm shift uh, on, uh, in that direction where we used to have a model, go to the lab, validate the model, come back, change the design, go to the lab, validate the model, come back and do that iteratively. I think, I mean, now what's going on is that we have, we build some stuff, we have some sensors in that thing, like the USS Enterprise or the human body, we have these wearables, we have these glucose monitoring systems, we have, uh, soon we have some probes in the brain, you know, if Elon Musk succeeds. So you never know exactly what's going to happen, but we are basically interconnected. If you look at the way people design buildings, you have Internet of Things go, working already with actual things communicating with each other with 5G. So all these things will gather huge amounts of data. And the question is not anymore, can I build something in the lab, go there, test it, come back here, you know, and do that all day until I'm satisfied with the result. But it's can I make my structure or system evolve as it lives its own life? in a way which uh, is informed by the sensing mechanisms that we have. So let's see how, um, how we can learn from... So this is going to be something where, where I, I hope that you will learn something, because I certainly learned something when I prepared the talk. And it's how do we learn to face a complex environment that we are born into, because uh, essentially we, we are just human beings, so we were at some point a baby. And when we were this baby, we didn't know anything about the force of gravity, for example. So we would just take our spoon, throw it out the high chair, and our parents would uh, patiently pick it up, put it back on the chair, and then we would take the left hand now, throw it even further, and the pa parent very calmly would go and pick it up again, and then we would spit on the floor, and then we would try to, you know, <laughs> use uh, yogurt as some sort of, of hair gel. And at the end of the day, the, the question would be, why are we, are we doing this? So essentially what the baby does is, is he, the baby is trying to learn. So how does that work? So initially in the, in the brain, people, kids, babies, even maybe in utero, have hypotheses that are built in. So we don't know how detailed these hypotheses are. And then they start living. So then evidence comes. So for example, most of you have no idea where I come from, who I am, what I'm doing, uh, if I'm a good speaker, bad speaker, uh, if I speak loud, or if I speak softly, and if I'm going to teach you something or not, and if you're going to learn, and it'd be exciting, so you don't know me. So you have a background, a priori assumption about me. You know, maybe you know I'm French, so may maybe I'm on strike all the time, or maybe you know, I come from Luxembourg, so maybe I'm into finance. So you have these hypotheses that are built into your brain because you don't know me, but you have some stereotype, typical ideas. Then you have some evidence. You're here listening to the talk, and you're continuously updating your view of me in that case. And you're maybe at the end of the talk will have a different view then at the beginning of the talk, maybe not. Maybe I will convince you that all the stereotypes you have in mind are true. Uh, but the way it will happen is that you will merge your a priori assumption with, your likely, with, the likelihood, uh, with the observations to make a likelihood. And this likelihood is going to be your new view and your new hypothesis about the world. So now next time you go to a talk, being a uh, talk I give or someone else, you will have a new hypothesis. And then if you come to a, to a talk that I give again next time, uh, maybe you won't come because your hypothesis was confirmed that I'm a bad speaker, or maybe you will come and then your hypothesis will be, uh, you know, bumped into the evidence, the new evidence, and you will have a new likelihood function which will become your new hypothesis and so on. And it happens that this is, according to Stanislas Dehen, who is a professor in Collège de France, the way that uh, babies learn. Uh, he's been working his whole life on this. And by the way, the talks are all uh, in English also, and subtitled, and it's amazing. There are hours of talks that you would, you know, I, I cannot stop listening when I, it's so mind-boggling, very, very interesting. So now let's try to explain mathematically how that works. So uh, that proves to you that I'm an engineer, because when I say mathematically, I show a tennis court. But um, what is going on? So for example, 
let's say that you play tennis against someone, you know that person, so you have a, prior, a priori assumption about where they usually serve. So let's say that they serve in the middle when they are situated at that corner of the field. I don't know, I don't play very well tennis very well, so, but I can imagine that you have some ways of guessing what's going to happen. Um, so you know what the ball, where the ball usually lands. Maybe you studied their style of play if you're already serious, you looked at videos, uh, if you're, I don't know, Roger Federer or someone, I mean, you probably studied in detail and you know where the ball lands. So this is your a priori knowledge. And then you look at the position of the person, the way the, the angle of the arm, the way they are situated on the court, and so on, and you think, ah, it looks like now they will rather do this than that. And so you update your knowledge. And then, of course, what you already guessed, what is going to be uh, your view of the situation is that it's going to be some sort of intersection of what you think the person normally does and what they seem like they are going to do now, right? And then you basically bump these two together, the prior knowledge you have with the likelihood looking at what you see, and that gives you a posterior. So this is the jargon that people use in uh, Bayesian inference, uh, which again, I'm not going to go about the controversy knowing who did what, because there is a lot of uh, discussion if it's Bayes or someone else, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's a law of combined probability, probability of something knowing something else, which we learn in, in high school. <coughs> So the probability of uh, X knowing Y, um, yeah, so that's what it means. The posterior is equal to the prior multiplied by the likelihood divided by the evidence. And these techniques are used all the time in areas of uh, science where we don't have a lot of data. So for example, in biomechanics or in health, uh, when we are talking about s situations where we cannot measure things easily because there's the availability of data is rare. If you have a lot of data, you can use a frequentist approach and just make 100 million runs or 100 million experiments, and it's easy to just put them together, get an average law of probability of the behavior of what you're observing, and everything works fine. If you have very little data, that's what we're interested in here, uh, you cannot do that, so what you do is you have a prior knowledge, which is going to inform what's going to happen next. So, for example, if you think the distribution of something is uniform, you put no information in the prior, meaning that you think everything is equi equiprobable. Let's say the probability of, of um, yeah, anyway, just you can imagine cases. But then if you know that maybe the average and is, looks like a, a log normal distribution, for example, you know the parameters of this log normal distribution a priori, and then when you observe something, you will update this. So, for example, if you have a patient that's coming in the operating theater and you want to know the stiffness of their brain, you may have a database of previous stiffnesses that will build the knowledge of the brain of all average patients that you've seen. And then you will update that with the new measurement that you make on that particular patient. And that allows you to build all the knowledge you can with the little data you have. Right? So what's important, there is a whole field of, in statistics where you ask yourself what is the role of the prior, because you can imagine it's very, it's very important, so you ask yourself is the prior informative or not informative, should I use an informative prior or not, because if, should I put bias in what I'm doing or not, similarly to when you use ChatGPT, as we will see later. So how did people... Um, uh, discover that for learning in human beings. I think this is really fascinating as what I'm showing it. It has nothing to do with mechanics, except that the things are moving around here. But uh, So you see you have uh, some sort of hid hidden thing, I mean, which you can see at first with four objects, three, I'm colorblind, I don't know what color they are, but let's say green, uh, three green and one blue. And uh, then you obfuscate the view of the kids or the adult, and one thing pops out. So in the first case, this green thing, let's say, pops out. In the second case, um, you have a majority of blue objects, or purple, and the green one com comes out. And then you show that to a kid that's about 18 months or 12 months old, and you observe their behavior. And what happens is that already uh, it's very clear that the right-hand right side is more probable than the left-hand side, because you have more of the green things, so of course if a green thing pops out, you're not surprised, but if your blue thing pops out, you're surprised. Um, and then what does a kid do at 12 months? They already realize that there is a higher probability that the green thing will pop out, 
than a blue thing. So it means that at 12 months, the kids are already able to have a sense of what is likely and what is not likely. Um, and how do they know this? You can follow the paper here. It's a paper by uh, Tiglas. And um, so how do they know it? They look at the face of the baby, and when they uh, start staring you know, with open white eyes, they uh, deduce that there is some sort of surprise going on uh, in that child, and they deduce that the, the kid actually found out that something is weird. What's going on? Um, another thing which is quite interesting about learning for um, is about how learn to learn to write. So I don't know how it works in languages that do not have uh, our, our alphabet, but in, uh, in our alphabet we have some very weird letters that look very similar, except that they are mirror images of each other. Like for example, B and D. So, and when you learn to write, you probably notice if you have kids that they uh, very often mix the B and the D, and the P and the whatever, Q, you know, for example. And uh, so psychologists did a lot of studies on that to try to figure out why that was the case. And it's not related to dyslexia. So it's not related to some sort of a priori problem in the brain of that particular person and not this one. And where it comes from is the fact that, and maybe you guess already, that when you um, recognize people, you don't, you don't care whether they look at you slightly from the right or slightly from the left, or if they are facing you like this, because you're used to recognizing faces that are symmetric. So if you look at this or that, this is, I think, Henry II. I don't know why I found this. It was the best thing I, I could find. Um, so I had to mirror the images myself because I couldn't find them from different angles, obviously. But if you look at these two, uh, for you it's the same. And so what does that mean? That if you look at the word Odile, which is very uh, famous in our lab, and Libo, these are exactly the same words because they are symmetric. So that means that in your brain, you develop some sort of circuitry which taught you that things are symmetric and that B and D are exactly the same, so why bother writing B or D? And that's why they write sometimes B, sometimes D. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not right, because in fact it doesn't matter. So what happens then is you need to unlearn what you, uh, the circuits that were already built in by generations, because this is not acquired, it is something which is inherited in the in the actual brain. So, conclusion of, uh, about this before we go to how machines learn. Uh, this is what Gopnik, uh, the psychologist, was saying, that a baby is a scientist in the crib, so essentially the baby is trying to learn by observing and making mistakes, essentially. So, first of all, there is a hypothesis mm -hmm. that the brain is able from birth and maybe before to perform statistical calculations which is maybe akin to Bayesian learning. So the, the teams there in, in Collège de France are also trying to mimic these circuits to make computers that optimize the calculations of Bayesian uh, calculations, because they, they try to mimic, to find which places in the brain do, do what, and to try to copy that. Um, and essentially, the brain has what, is a, what we, we call a model, because it's a set of hypotheses which uh, projects onto the world, so rigid objects, causality, and so on, which is exactly what we think as a model, um, as, you know, as scientists, or as engineers, or mathematicians, or biologists, or whatever we're doing. And uh, then we select hypotheses based on the plausibility, and this is what we do also in, uh, in engineering. And what is really important, and, in, and to me, mind-boggling, is that most signals in the brain, according to Stanislas Dehaene, it are error signals, which means that when you try to learn something, you know, giving you a bad grade at school and telling you you did wrong, therefore you, you lose two points. It's actually counterproductive because what actually causes learning is errors. If you don't fail, I mean, it's obvious to everybody, but it's, 
not, ob not obvious to the way that people teach kids and by giving them bad marks when they fail. Because when they fail, they actually learn something. So if you just, every time some, someone fails, you, you withdraw five marks, then uh, what you're teaching them is don't fail. You're not teaching them anything in terms of what they are learning. So uh, Stanislas Dehaene is also on the board of the French uh, education system and trying to reform this uh, by using actual science uh, about learning, as opposed to just doing random things as we are used to doing. So uh, what is also interesting about error signals is the reward prediction error about dopamine uh, circuits. Because, so for example, if you go, you write a grant application and you're very excited. So the first peak of, you have a peak of dopamine which sets you in motion to write the grant application. Then you write the grant application, but at the end, you're, not, you're either very satisfied about the result or you're unsatisfied or you're just at zero level. And what's super interesting is that your ability to predict your satisfaction level a priori will dictate whether your dopamine reserves will be up or down. So for example, if uh, something easier to understand, if you go and look for something to eat or drink, or if it's an espresso or something, you really want an espresso, you leave your office, I want an espresso, so dopamine peak, you go there, you drink the espresso, it's really bad. So then you're disappointed. Your dopamine level will actually be lowered, and instead of being satisfied with the result, you will feel worse than if you did not have the espresso in the first place. But if the espresso was just amazing compared to your prediction of what it should have been, then you will increase your dopamine baseline. And so, to me, it's very, it's, it's quite fun to think that the, we, ha we have a way, we have learned to essentially work with errors the whole time. Because what, what exactly are we doing when we do modeling, which is data-driven or not data-driven, is we are also constantly measuring errors and minimizing residuals. We are minimizing differences between what we want and what we have. And this is precisely what we're doing there. Um, now I would like to move to the, the second part where we're talking about a type of change in paradigm, which I, I absolutely have to pronounce the right way now. <laughs> so, <laughs> where um, instead of uh, moving, so okay, a model is a function or a functional a function from x to y, right? So x is a point in some r d and y is a point in r q or something. I mean, we don't really care where it's coming from or going to. And this thing is either uh, the usual way is you have the structure of f known. For example, if you, you know, you, you know we're talking about the PDE for equilibrium, you know that this is the equilibrium equations. You can write them. So you know the structure and you're trying to calibrate it. What is the stiffness? What the Young's modulus, what is, you know, and so on. So you're calibrating the model, but you know the model. And now I think where we are going, at least definitely in the work we're doing, is that you have very little a priori knowledge about the model that you have. So if you uh, open a new patient up, if you're a surgeon, you try to operate on the brain, you can have an a priori idea of what the constitutive model is, but you may be totally wrong. If you talk to a neurosurgeon, they will tell you the brain consistency is completely different from patient to patient. Some are crisp, and they can describe this in very, uh, you know, very colorful vocabulary. Um, the, is it a, it's a sponge, it's very soft, or it's very crisp. It depends if they took med uh, med medicaments and so on. So, Basically, you don't know exactly. And where we are, uh, what we are working on in, in my group is the interface between uh, Newton on the left-hand side, where you know everything, basically. I'm just using Newton as an example because you can write the laws of Newton. You, you know that if you're not talking about huge things or very small things, it's going to hold. And on the right-hand side, you're talking about the other extreme where you have huge amounts of data, but you have no clue how it's structured. You have no clue what the relationships are between things. For example, if you um, are analyzing Instagram data and you're computing the probability of having a Coca-Cola bottle on a picture taken on in the pub X or Y in Glasgow, uh, then you, know, you, you cannot a priori say what the probability will be. But if you have a lot of data, you can guess what the probability will be. But you have no model telling you the probability is a function of the position of the pub, the number of people coming in, the density of the city, and so on. You don't have this, this model is not existent. But you can maybe build it, and you can maybe learn it even by trial and error. So I will show you now a few case studies. 
where we are in between the left and the right extreme. So the left-hand side is really we have entire un understanding of the model, at least we think so. We can update the model, but we have at least some key information. On the right-hand side, where we have really almost no way to write an, uh, a model mathematically. Okay, and you, generally we are in between these two, and the cursor is just moving. Okay, it's really moving slowly. Good, okay. So essentially, the, um, the brain is behaving as a Bayesian computer, more or less. And how does it work in machine learning? So now that's maybe the second point that if you have not looked at machine learning before, you may maybe learn something here. Maybe not, but I'll do my best to be at least a bit clear. Because machine learning, there, is, there are many types of machine learning, but the one I'm talking about now is uh, basically a type of regression. So you can imagine that you have a set of points, and these sets of points are uh, on the left hand side here, these little stars. And your idea is to fit a curve or a line through the stars. Right. So, how do you do it? Well, you do it exactly as least squares, is you fit a curve. So, you, you, you say that you want to look at the solution as, but this is not going to make any sense. Okay. So, look at the solution as a polynomial function, for example, and you would say, typically you would use a polynomial, and you would say, I look at what I want minus my approximation of what I want. I compute the distance between the two, either uh, Euclidean distance, like L2 norm, or a higher norm, like H1, if you're interested in derivatives, or the maximum norm, if this is what you want, a any norm that makes sense, and then you will differentiate that with respect to the parameters, and it will give you an optimization problem. That's the way you minimize. That's it. So in machine learning, so-called, it's essentially the same. What changes is that the, pre the approximation is not a polynomial function anymore. It's something coming from a complex convolution or other of functions that have a special form, shape. Um, so that's essentially how it works you have first a forward propagation. So what you do is you do linear combinations of these three inputs with some coefficients and parameters. It gives you a prediction. So what, as you can see here, the Z is nothing else but linear. So there is really nothing uh, breathtaking. I mean, it is affine, actually, but it's nothing breathtaking about that. And then you, uh, sub you just substitute that. You multiply several layers together. You substitute that into the approximation, and then you minimize with respect to the coefficients that you have, meaning the weights and the biases of, the, of each layer. So if you think about it, you're going to do a back propagation where you try to minimize the potential energy, which is exactly what you do all the time. So here you minimize a function, and you minimize it using uh, steepest gradient descent or some stochastic uh, method. That's it. So that's basically what you do in uh, uh, in machine learning when you do these, uh, these techniques. So uh, what in our lab, I just want to show you one application of that because I think it's, it's fun. What we try to do is we are interested originally in medical simulations because in, anyway, uh, in 2007 I started to try to ask myself whether we could simulate cutting in soft tissues in real time. And uh, approximately 15 years later, we were more or less able to do it with our mm -hmm. estimation and so on. So that was really a success, but I, I really underestimated the difficulty of this problem. Um, so basically what we're trying is to do is that, but the problem is to do things in real time when you have no clue about the, the model, you have no clue about the patient, you have no clue about the model parameters, uh, there are a lot of difficulties. So you cannot just take finite elements in Abacus, uh, put the model there with 10,000 elements and hope that you will solve in real time because that's not going to work. So you need to have fancy ways. So either you solve the problem faster using fast preconditioners and solution methods on GPUs. So computer science colleagues in, in RIA with whom we work do only that. So they focus on GPU solving of of sets of linear equations as fast as possible on the highest grades of GPUs. So that's part of what they do. Uh, or you try to pre-compute as much as you can. So this is what before machine learning 
let's say, exponential growth, people were calling that model order reduction, such as proper orthogonal decomposition, proper generalized decomposition, Caron and Love expansion, all these keywords. So basically what you do is you pre-compute as much as you can, and then you hope that what you see in reality will be similar to what you pre-computed. So that's what we do here. If you see this elephant, the goal is to predict how it will fall forward. And so we fix the, the feet, and then we, ap we apply some force. And uh, the question is, how is it going to deform? And I want to solve that in real time. Let's say, when I say real time, let's, let's say 100 simulations per second. It's not exactly precise, but let's say between 50 and 100 per second. Because this is a refresh rate of a screen. If you want haptic feedback, it's more 500 to 1,000 simulations per second. So this is a different story, but okay, let's say real time is, is uh, 100 per second, then you cannot solve 100 times that problem per second uh, using standard computers. It's just not going to work for large mesh. So what we do is we pre-compute with different forces. So we apply, pre we apply forces on that elephant, but forces we don't know whether we will need at the end of the day. We just apply random forces, right? And then we hope that among those random forces, the force that will be ap applied at the end of the day uh, during the surgery will be some sort of combination of those, right? And then, uh, and then that's basically what you do when you do model order reduction. You take a superposition of modes. And as long as you do not have local localization or fracture or damage or very high frequency oscillations that were not in what you learned, that will work more or less fine. So now with with these, uh, these neural networks, things that work exactly the same way. So what you do is you pre-train the neural network to learn if I apply a force F, I get a displacement U. So you have a mapping, the neural network does a mapping between the force F at all the nodes, so it's a very large force vector. U is a large displacement vector with as many entries, and you basically teach it the relationship between F and U. So you transform the neural network into a stiffness, basically, something that learns the stiffness of the, of the, of the elephant. And again, as long as you stay within the training range, everything is fine. I'm summarizing here five papers, so it's, that's logical that it's uh, maybe a bit hard to follow, but as long as you stay within the training range, let's say you apply a load of one Newton to 100 Newton, and if you now test your learning for 50 newtons, it will work. But if you test it for 200 newtons, it will fail. If you test it for 0.01 newton, it will also fail. And you see very clearly the divergence. Uh, I, I can show you that. It's very clear. So then the next step that uh, Saurab Deshpande, who defended last week, his thesis took is to have a Bayesian approach where you have an uncertainty level for the forces that you apply and you have an uncertainty level for the displacement you measure. Uh, and at the end, what you get is not a strict value, but you get a 95% confidence interval that the deformation of the elephant is within that bound and that bound, which goes around the problem of having uh, insufficient data. But of course, what is hidden behind this is that you need to have a clue about the distribution of the forces you apply. If you know nothing at all, if you don't, you know, if you don't know that it's a Gaussian distribution centered on 20 newtons with a standard deviation of so-and-so, then you're just guessing again, right? So you need to have some data to put into the Bayesian thing, because otherwise, what can you do? And this, in my opinion, is the hardest possible thing, is to get these data that you put into the Bayesian forward simulations, because doing forward Bayesian simulations or forward statistical simulations is very easy. You just solve, solve, solve Monte Carlo, Markov chain, and so on. It's very well known. But finding the parameters and the distributions of those parameters that correspond to real life, so the inverse stochastic problem which gives you the statistical distribution of the parameters, that is very hard. And that, I think, is something which uh, keeps everybody in check. But, um, but there are some advances. Uh, in that direction. So um, what Saurab did is he used exactly what's done in ChatGPT, but he did that for mechanics. So this is called the attention, the attention of neural networks, and we, we could talk about it, but unfortunately uh, there is no time today. What you can do is there is a very, very nice paper which is called Attention is All You Need. Uh, this is the basis of ChatGPT, and uh, you, you can basically see there is a YouTube video which is super clear. Uh, at least it gives you an idea how these things work and why ChatGPT spits out garbage after some time. 
um, and uh, it's quite fun. If you tested it as much as I did, you will have a lot of fun trying to uh, listen to this thing because it really explains what you observe by testing the, the thing in real life. Okay, so now a little break because otherwise you will fall asleep. I know it's been about, uh, it's already too long, so uh, I, uh, this is a break where you will have to do a little game and it's about attention, so, but please pay attention and try to play the, the game, right? And if you know it, please don't tell your neighbors. So you have to listen. I, I don't know if the sound is on, but basically if it's not on, it's going to tell you to count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. So we will have people wearing white and black. They will be in a place, they will pass some basketball, and the key point is going to be to try to count how many times the ball is passed between the white players, not the black players. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. One, two, three. Wrong pass counts or does not count? Very good. But did you see the gorilla? But did you see the gorilla? Yeah. No. Who, saw, who didn't see it? I saw it. Who saw it? I didn't see it. Yeah. So. And it's copyrighted. It is available for use in talks and teaching. It's from Bizcog Production. And, okay, so that was, not, uh, that was not only to make a break, because, but it's actually nice because then you can refocus a bit, but uh, it's also to, to show um, the, the attention mechanism that we were talking about. And so the reason why that works is because your brain is very good at uh, filtering stuff. So if you think white, 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 you will only see white. It's the same thing as when you have, uh, for example, a sequence of letters that is shown to you and you are asked to see the G. So you will focus on the G, and then if you ask what is the letter coming after G, you have no clue. Because you focus on the G and you have uh, what is called an attention blink, which is also why you never use your phone in your car. Because if you, as soon as you focus on your, on your phone, your brain is actually, you think you're paying attention, but you're not paying attention to the rest. Because you have a blink, as soon as you refocus, you have a time lapse during which your brain is unable to focus on anything else than what you just focused on. That's why it's super deadly to do this stuff. Uh, okay, anyway, so that was a bit of an aside, but I, as you can see, I like these, these things a lot. Um, and I, I want now to take you through uh, a case study very quickly, because otherwise we won't have time, and to show you how I, how my group became interested in what we're doing. So we started really by phenomenological models, fracture mechanics, then von Mises plasticity, uh, then nonlinear fracture mechanics with explosions, then multi-scale fracture mechanics because we thought maybe we don't know phenomenologically what the models are, and then finally uh, biomechanics where I wrote in my ERC grant, I remember, I will never touch constitutive models because it's not m my field and I don't want to do that. And then I did exactly the opposite later <laughs> because I said, if I don't have a constitutive model, what can I do? I need to at least be able to update the a priori knowledge I have depending on the patient that's on the table. And even if I'm not interested myself in constitutive models, I need to know about them because I need to find the coefficients in real time, and that's what I'm going to show you now. So now I'm going to show you two case studies, I hope, that I manage. I have actually three, but I think I skipped the archaeology one because we don't have the time and it's maybe less related. So the first case study is about astrocytes. Um, and uh, the PhD student who worked on this is Sofia Farina. She is now joining EPFL uh, in the Blue Brain project. 
to work on exactly the same thing. So uh, it's uh, astrocytes are cells in the brain that are glial cells that surround neurons and for a long time people thought that uh, astrocytes had absolutely no point to be there and glial cells were completely useless. Um, it turns out that they are very useful. And now you, s you can see here two astrocytes on the left and right. The left is a do you think it's a good one or a bad one? I mean, let's say a healthy one or a non-healthy one. Ah, difficult to say. Yeah. So left is healthy, right is unhealthy. So right has Alzheimer's disease and left doesn't. So the question that Sophia was asking is, is the shape of the astrocyte related to its ability to help the neurons? But first of all, let's understand what a neuron does and what an astrocyte does. This is an astrocyte for a mouse brain. As you can see, it looks very bushy, lots of ramifications and so on. And her quest was to try to figure out how to solve coupled partial differential equations in that domain. So the domain, as you can see, is not the simplest thing. Um, it's quite complex, and, uh, but it turns out that my whole life until that point had been to work on three boundary problems with complex interfaces without any meshing, so unfitted meshes like CUTFEM as was shown uh, in the case of interfaces before. Um, so what is an astrocyte? First of all, it's a very abundant glial cell in the brain. What is it used for? It is, uh, of course, it looks like a star. That's why it's called astrocyte astrocyte cell in the shape of a star and it connects the blood vessels that are the red things that you just saw here appearing with the neurons which are the blue things that just appeared. So uh, the, uh, its goal is to take food from the blood and carry it to the neurons and the way it does that is it essentially takes glucose and transforms it into lactate and lactate is the food that the neurons eat. The big question is that some astrocytes, it is thought, are too greedy. So what they do is they take the glucose, but instead of giving lactate to the neurons, they keep it for themselves and make ATP to generate energy, but for themselves, not for the neurons. So then the neuron may degenerate, and that's an, a hypothesis that could explain partly Alzheimer's disease. So these astrocytes could be too, too greedy. So how do we know? Uh, whether the astrocytes are greedy or not, and uh, how do we know whether the shape of the astrocyte makes any, any difference. So what Sophia did, and I'm skipping the details, is that she took a healthy and not healthy astrocyte and did uh, an MRI of this, and then she took the image, and we modeled that using our in-house code, uh, where we uh, coupled the different uh, PDEs, uh, which is I remember the beginning was quite tricky because these equations have very large coefficients and very small coefficients. It is super unstable, but we're using Phoenix and she was able to solve that within a few years. Um, so let, I just want to show you uh, the results because otherwise we will never be there. But at the end of the day, the conclusion was very simple that there is a clear uh, role in the, of the shape. And the second part of uh, her PhD was to try to figure out what is the, uh, the impact on the calcium waves. And the calcium waves are another thing I cannot explain, but, and what is the role of the shape on the calcium waves. And again, uh, you imagine that you have a calcium input at the bottom left of the star or bottom left of the circle. And the idea is to try to see if you fix a line here in the middle of the, of the star, whether uh, there is a difference in the case of a circle and, or in the case of a star, and there is a clear variation. And now what we're trying to do is to try to see if we can generalize this to, uh, to real shapes, because for now the simulations were done in simplistic cases um, for the calcium waves. But for the, for the previous case that I showed here, uh, we, Sophia was able to show that the shape, as you can see here on the right, has a huge impact on the ability of the astrocyte to metabolize glucose and get uh, lactate to uh, the neuron. Okay, uh, second case study is about uh, surgery. So this is what led, what led us to... Um, from 2007 to now, and I've been trying to do that, and finally it, uh, we are converging somewhere. Uh, this is the European Investment Bank in Luxembourg, and this is a banker, or actually an economist, who is one of the chief guys there. And uh, Arnaud Mazier, our PhD student at the time now in Australia, uh, New South Wales, is uh, scanning the banker and showing him that he can immediately get 
an image of him on this tablet. And basically, the next step is going to be to have a model of that uh, banker, which is totally useless. Uh, but um, because you know, having a 3D model of a banker doesn't help uh, anybody. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, it can help in other cases. And what we're interested in is breast conserving surgery for breast cancer. And in that case, the, the problem is extremely simple to understand. When you do a, an MRI for a patient, the patient is facing down. But when you do the operation, the patient is facing up. And uh, as Newton taught us, there is gravity involved somewhere. So uh, gravity is going to have an impact on the deformation of the breast of the patient, which means that if you know where the tumor is located at that particular site during the inter before the intervention, you have to guess where it's going to be during the intervention. And this requires doing some simulations. So the first one is going to be to remove gravity because gravity is imposed upon that patient. So the idea is that virtually we will remove gravity and then change the direction of gravity to make it applied in the proper direction that's seen during the intervention. So it's as if we were taking the patient to the space uh, station and then bringing uh, him or her, because it can happen to men as well, um, back to Earth and in order to make the surgery. And then um, we essentially do the following. We have some sort of assumption about the constitutive model of, uh, of the breast, of the parameters as well, and we update that in real time. So this is, I'm going to skip the details, but what we do is do, we do some measurements. We apply gravity to do uh, an undeformed configuration. Then we reapply gravity to uh, get the deformed configuration. And then we simply do this error control thing. We, con we measure the difference between what we compute and what we measure using the, uh, using the uh, LiDAR, right? And then we finally get optimal, let's say, parameters. And this is done, and this is what is new in this, is that this is done to totally in real time. So when we have the, the patient coming in, we have the uh, preoperative images. We remove gravity, reapply gravity, and this is the time it takes. Now, in real, you're seeing the algorithm converge in real time to the proper parameters. And then after that, you can have an idea where the tumor is located because you assume the deformation of the breast to be something. And you hope, and there are lots of questions behind, of course, that what you see on the surface of the breast is characteristic of what happens inside the breast. So that, you know. Uh, there are lots of open questions like the connection between the skin and the tissue, the pectoral muscles, the, the ribs, and so on. So the, the problem is far from being solved, but uh, at least we have, uh, we have a pipeline which works, and it is open source, obviously, as everything we do, uh, which, and it's called Sonix. Uh, it's a mixture of SOFA and Phoenix. SOFA is real-time simulations, and Phoenix is... A type of code where you can write strong form by hand and it will automatically get the code spit it out. So now we can essentially have a new constitutive model implemented for a new patient uh, using one line of code only. So if you have a new constitutive model you want to implement, you just write it in, in Phoenix. Uh, yes, in Phoenix. And it automatically will be inherited by SOFA so that you can solve in real time. So I think this is really, really exciting, at least for me, because at the time I wrote my ERC grant, I don't know how many years ago, 15 maybe, I, uh, I, these type of things I had no idea how to actually do. I was very worried, constitutive model, that won't work, I won't be able to implement it, it won't converge and so on. Now it's all basically, you have the best of both worlds. It's not you know, totally slick yet, but, um, but I think it's super nice, the work that uh, Arnaud did. Okay, so I skipped these details. Um, oh, yeah, I just wanted to tell you also on that front that we developed also error estimates in real time. So using a posteriori error estimates based on either residual based or, or uh, adjoint based methods or Zinkevich Zoo approaches, which allow you to optimize the mesh for a given quantity of interest. Because typically a surgeon is not interested in the energy in the patient, but they are interested in 
let's say, the deformation of the foot of this diabetic patient, or they are interested in the location of the tumor, how it deforms, how it moves. So your quantity of interest is not the energy, because you always minimize for the energy, right, as an engineer, but this is not what people are interested in. So here we can optimize the mesh, and you see there's quite a big difference between the optimal mesh for a quantity of interest and the, the optimal mesh for the energy. They are not at all the same, uh, which is also something that's not very well known. Um, okay, so that is done, and I need to accelerate. Okay, I still want to talk to you about this because it's really fun. Uh, this is funded by Institute of Advanced Studies, it will be very quick. And it has to do again with uh, having LiDAR images of uh, places. So this is in Iraq, in Mosul, and uh, the student here, Juan Aguilar, is absolutely passionate about this place. He's been going there for 10 years, taking measurements in Mosul underground and so on. It's a place where uh, historically it's very important because this is the, the hill of the prophet uh, Jonah, basically, which uh, you know, for people that, uh, that are uh, Christians is very important. Uh, it's called Tel Nebi Yunus, and it's an Assyrian. They found out that underneath was an Assyrian palace, basically a palace that dates back to the uh, Assyrian civilization. Then uh, there was before that an early Christian monastery. After that, an Ottoman Museum. All of that uh, was remodeled by Saddam Hussein, and after that it was again remodeled but by the Islamic State, but for that, uh, that time the remodeling was quite final because they just destroyed it. So uh, that was quite a disaster, and on top of that, the Islamic uh, had tunnels that were trying to loot uh, and to try to get loot out of the tunnels and try to take artifacts and sell them on the black market. But fortunately, because in a way it was good, because uh, Juan can, could go into the tunnels and make a total, complete LiDAR reconstruction of everything that, that was there and make a complete 3D model of the place, including the cracks, including the slanted floors and the broken stone panels and so on. And now what, what our goal is going to be is to try, and this is a huge problem, and I really think it's almost uh, unsolvable, is to look at the present and to try to go back to the past and reconstruct the events in, in the order they uh, took place. So we're working with an historian, and, uh, Andrea uh, Binsfeld, and uh, with an art historian as well, uh, to try to figure out in which order things happen, because for them it's very important to know. And for us it's a huge problem, because it's an inverse problem where you need to look at all possibilities in the past with very little, little data. So it's almost unsolvable, but we have an idea at least how to make a proper model of the place which we can use. Uh, okay, so I will uh, skip this um, because I would rather have a bit of discussion, but uh, yeah, th this is essentially, I will st stop on that. This is a, an idea of uh, what we can do with what we did is we scanned our own building at the University of Luxembourg, which is a 19-story building, because one day there was a fire uh, drill, and uh, what they did is they opened the vent of the stair sh shaft at the top. And so we wanted to, when we saw that, we thought, okay, that really makes no sense because the staircase is supposed to be used to evacuate, and if you open the vent, it's going to make a chimney and the whole thing will be totally smoked and people will just die there. And, uh, and since they didn't believe us, we just made a simulation and they still did not believe us. Uh, because if you open the vent, obviously you have a negative pressure at the top which is going to suck all the smoke up and uh, if you close the vents, then it's going to contain the smoke. I mean, quite logical. But uh, yeah, that did not convince them and the reason why I show it is because we use this LiDAR to actually move around and take uh, an image of the whole building uh, so that we have directly the real image of the place because we didn't have blueprints. Uh, and then we could actually show them the real sim simulation of the actual place, but that did not uh, convince anybody. So <laughs> it is still open now at the, at the next fire drill. Okay, so this case study I will unfortunately have to uh, skip because of otherwise uh, it will be far too late. Uh, it's too bad it was on the meniscus, but uh, we can discuss that uh, Another time, I just wanted to go to the final slide, if I can find it. But in the meantime, thank you for your attention, and uh, I look forward to questions. Thank you.